Although railroads had emerged as one of the most powerful economic drivers in the United States history in the mid 19th century, the country's river systems remained one of its greatest assets and none more important than the Mississippi River. Because of it, farmers from the Midwest and planters from the South could get their goods to domestic and international markets quickly. The Civil War tore the country apart and it is no surprise that the Mississippi River became a focal point for both sides as they struggled against one another. Confederate General Braxton Bragg commented that the river was of more importance to us than all the country together. And Union General William Tecumseh Sherman stated, to secure the safety of the navigation of the Mississippi River, I would slay millions. On that point, I am not only insane, but mad. Fortunately, the Great West is with me there. The staging ground was set for the Confederacy and the Union to fight for the vital river that was termed the Father of Rivers. But one of the most significant battles to occur for its control didn't even take place near its banks. It occurred along one of its tributaries, the Tennessee River, near a little church named Shiloh, or Place of Peace. Throughout 1861, the two sides met in relatively small engagements, with the Confederate defensive line in the West remaining virtually unmoved. However, on January 19, 1862, Confederate Generals George B. Crittenden and Felix Zollicoffer were defeated by Union General George H. Thomas at Mill Springs, Kentucky. Zollicoffer lost his life in the defeat. With one of the biggest threats in the eastern portion of Kentucky defeated and contained, Union forces were able to concentrate their troops against Confederate General and Commander of the Western Theater, Albert Sidney Johnston in central Kentucky. Johnston hoped to protect Tennessee's waterways, the Mississippi River, and Tennessee's capital, Nashville, by setting up his defensive line in southern Kentucky. However, the Cumberland and Tennessee Rivers created a perfect invasion route for Union troops led by Ulysses S. Grant, and about a month after Mill Springs, Grant would capture the two major fortifications protecting those tributaries of the Mississippi River, Fort Henry and Fort Donelson. The Confederates were forced to fall back to a more defensible location in northern Mississippi, but Johnston needed to land a decisive blow against the Union if he was to stop the takeover of more Confederate territory. Union forces gathered at Fort Henry to be sent by river boats up the Tennessee River with some troops traveling by land. The crowded boats over this long trip made the soldiers miserable. One soldier commented, You may probably think that riding a steamboat is fun. Well, it is a nice place to ride in warm weather, but on a boat where there is nearly 2,000 men on board and then stay on it over a week is one of the most unpleasant places to live yet, and added to this, Yet, we had nothing but river water to drink, which is not fit for a hog to drink. The first boats arrived at Savannah, Tennessee on March 8th, where they found loyal Unionists there to greet them. Confederate sympathizers had left upon hearing of the Federal advance. One old gray-headed man who, when he saw the boats come up, he went down with the tears rolling down his cheeks and greeted them as hard as he could. Many of the young men of the area began joining Illinois and Ohio units. Some Confederates were spotted at a location called Pittsburgh Landing, and General Hurlbut's division was sent to secure that location and drive back the rebels. General Sherman, after testing other landings, found that it was the only location that could handle the boat traffic, and he alerted his commander, General Charles F. Smith, who had recently taken over from Grant at General Henry Halleck's direction. Smith confirmed the location as the encampment of the army. While going from a boat to a small rowboat, Smith injured one of his legs and skinned up his shin, which became very sore and swollen, but he would continue to direct troop movements until Halleck reversed his decision and placed Grant back in command of federal forces on the expedition. Albert Sidney Johnston scrambled out of Kentucky and Middle Tennessee with the state government in tow. He settled on concentrating his forces at Corinth, Mississippi, the site of a major crossroads of railroads and the president of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis, sent him troops from other departments and other areas of the South. Regiments and brigades were coming in by rail and by foot from the banks of the Mississippi River and as far away as the Gulf Coast to aid Johnston. General Polk's units would be involved in a multiple rail car pileup on the way to northern Mississippi, but the army was slowly coming together. A soldier amazed at the sight of the growing army explained with glee that, we are part of a grand army whose tents are pitched on the ridges all about us as far as we can see through the woods. At Reveille, we hear bands of music in every direction. 
some so far off as to be almost inaudible. By this we know that our force is considerable. Although the army looked grand in its size, Confederate General Pierre Gustave Toutant Beauregard was charged with the immense task of organizing them into army units, and he opted for the corps system. This type of organization with a new army created a need for more brigadier generals, and thus many colonels of regiments who were raw recruits themselves would command large brigades of likewise green troops. A series of arrests, particularly Generals Crittenden and Carroll for drunkenness and neglect of command, created another power vacuum where unproven officers were placed in command of large units, like John C. Breckinridge, who was not West Point trained. Many of the troops entering camp had just mustered in and had yet to fire their rifles, some batteries yet to fire their cannons. Although it was a hulking force, it was dangerously undertrained. Ultimately, it would have been better for Johnston to have waited while his men were properly trained, and he preferred that course of action. But the movement of Union troops out of Pittsburgh Landing forced his hand. Additionally, he found that Grant's forces were split at the moment, and to give himself the best possible advantage, he decided to attack while the Federals were weak, before General Don Carlos Buell could reinforce Grant. Although Johnston was the commander of the army, he allowed Beauregard to organize the march to Pittsburgh Landing and lay out the tactical situation once there. The army moved out on April 3rd in a confusing mass of humanity, units marching and countermarching, attempting to fit within the puzzle that was Beauregard's marching orders. Nevertheless, the army was now on the move, poised to strike the unsuspecting Union forces at the landing. As the army formed into battle lines, they sent out skirmishers to fill out the Union positions. Some Federal pickets caught Confederate prisoners and locked them in the Shiloh Church. It was April 5th, and despite the sounds of skirmishing and the astonishing amount of rabbits, deer, and other wildlife moving through their encampment, the Federals did not realize the entire Confederate army was less than a mile away from their position. It was on the evening of April 5th that Johnston happened upon a group of his corps commanders and Beauregard discussing withdrawing, fearing that they had lost the element of surprise. Johnston ended the discussion in stating, Gentlemen, we shall attack at daylight tomorrow. As he was walking away, he remarked to a staff officer, I would fight them if they were a million. They can present no greater front between these two creeks than we can, and the more men they crowd in there, the worse we can make it for them. His plan was to turn the Union Army away from the river and the safety of their gunboats by driving in the Union's left flank, and as he put it, I intend to hammer them. About 4 a.m., the Confederate Army roused up from their sleep and took up their positions in preparation for the major attack. Instead of lining up parallel to the Union in a west-to-east orientation, they instead lined up in a northwest-to-southeast orientation, and this would play a significant role in the movement of the Army in one simultaneous assault that Beauregard had planned. Nevertheless, not all of the Union forces were unsuspecting. Many brigade and regimental commanders sent out companies and larger units to reconnoiter the ground. One of those units was the 25th Missouri, who approached Fraley Field, discovering the 3rd Mississippi Battalion on the other end of the field, opposing them. Each side let loose volleys at one another. Johnston recorded the time of those first shots at 5.14 a.m. The Battle of Shiloh had begun. They battled for an hour before the Missourians and Michiganders fell back a short distance and linked up with the rest of the brigade, who was coming towards the sound of battle. It was around 6.30 when the main Confederate line of Hardy's Corps lurched forward against Peabody, but the movement was slow because of the dense undergrowth and undulating terrain that forced regiments to halt and realign their companies. Despite the overwhelming numbers, the rebels were moving amazingly slow against such an inferior force. The Union Brigade fell back when confronted with the entirety of Hardy's Corps, and now the perpendicular nature of the Confederate battle line became cumbersome. Beauregard emphasized keeping the lines together, but that was easier said than done with shells exploding, bullets whizzing by soldiers' heads, and the uneven terrain destroying the linear formations. Brigadier General Patrick Claiborne's regiment sat to Wood's left, but his brigade swung abruptly north, breaking contact with Wood's men. Now, Hardy had to swing his entire corps northward, all the while attempting not to disconnect his brigades. Therefore, Claiborne's troops became engaged first, all the while the rest of the men in the corps would lose valuable time and be unable to support him right away. 
Claiborne, an Irish immigrant who had served in the British military prior to immigrating to the United States, moved his men toward a valley containing the Shiloh Branch, where he could see Sherman's encampment. As his men made their way toward the enemy, the brigade split to avoid the swampy area and to secure the flank, with two regiments going to the right and the other four shuffling to the left to avoid as much of the swampy area as possible. Claiborne's horse became stuck and threw the Irishman, and he barely extricated himself and his mount. Sherman, now drawn to the sounds of battle, wanted to see for himself what engagement had erupted. Claiborne's skirmishers, seeing the mounted gentleman, fired, hitting Sherman in the hand and killing his escort, Thomas Holliday. After that brief brush with death, Sherman wasted no time in ordering forward his brigades. By this point in the battle, the Confederate plan to keep their frontline brigades in contact with one another had fallen apart. Claiborne's men had broken off from Wood's brigade because the terrain forced him on a more northerly route. His right two regiments launched three assaults against the Ohioans, but got repulsed badly, eventually forcing both regiments to fall back. Of the 425 men the 6th Mississippi took into battle, 300 had either been killed or wounded. The 70% casualty rate gave the nickname to that unit, the Bloody Sixth. Braxton Bragg's brigades were close behind Claiborne's men, and after the Irishman's troops failed to dislodge the Union defenders, Bragg sent Patton Anderson's brigade to the front, and together, both brigades slammed into Sherman's troops, but the repulse was another bloody one for the Confederates. Seeing that Hardy's Corps' left flank was in the air, Bragg sent the brigade of Colonel Preston Pond in a big swinging motion out to the west to secure the battle line. Brigadier General Daniel Ruggles, Anderson's division commander, begged Brigadier General Bushrod Johnson of Polk's Corps to send his brigade to help Anderson and what was left of Claiborne's brigade to push back the Yankees. Johnson's men attacked just to the right of the other two brigades. No headway could be made, however, and the Union batteries played havoc in the Confederate ranks. Johnson sent the right two regiments, Blythe's Mississippians and the 154th Tennessee, in an effort to outflank the stubborn Union regiments. But Johnson's left began to give way, and most likely would have broke if Lieutenant Colonel Robert Charles Tyler of the 15th Tennessee hadn't drew his pistol to force his and other regiments to reform. Tyler would have three horses shot out from under him and would soon become wounded himself, having to be taken from the field. The reformed units would attack again, but ultimately got pushed back taking heavy casualties, especially in the form of officers. Bushrod Johnson himself would be wounded, shot in the stomach. An odd reunion of sorts took place as the wounded Johnson rode to the rear. He found his way to a hospital where, as chance would have it, two of his former students from the University of Nashville were lying wounded awaiting the overworked surgeon. The students were members of the 6th Mississippi, and when they saw their former professor arrive, they helped him from his horse and laid him on the ground. After conversing with him for a few moments, he asked if they could get a Yankee paper from his back pocket that some of the members of his regiment had picked up from the battlefield. The surgeon then called the boys to be examined, and they left him laying on the ground, wounded, reading the newspaper. The Confederate lines were disorganized, and with each regiment that attacked through the valley losing a considerable amount of men, some brigades were just a hodgepodge of what men could be pulled together without regard for which regiment they were in. Desperate to find more men to launch at the well-defended troops of William T. Sherman, the brigade of Colonel Robert M. Russell was sent to the front to the northern end of Ray Field to support what was left of the rebel right flank. A few of Claiborne's men had stayed in that sector as the rest had pulled back. The terrain again disrupted an attack. Russell's men dove down into the valley of the shallow branch, when to avoid the swampy terrain, his right two regiments splintered off to the east while the 11th Louisiana advanced on the Union battery that had been delivering destruction to the Confederates all morning, but were thrown back in confusion. Colonel Samuel F. Marks of the 11th, who had lost his right arm at the Battle of Belmont, now lost his left arm in the bloody assault. 22nd Tennessee had finally extricated itself from the swamp and together they prepared for an assault. Sherman had held on brilliantly, utilizing the terrain to the best of his advantage and had held off attacks by four Confederate brigades over the course of two hours. One soldier would name the little valley created by the Shiloh Branch the Valley of Death. As Russell's men were coming up to support the Confederate right flank in this sector, Major General John A. McClernand sent messengers to Sherman asking what the situation was 
and when McClernand started seeing the wounded moving through his camp north of Sherman, he sent Colonel Julius Wraith's brigade to extend the Union line to the east. Now Sherman was prepared to throw back any Confederate unit that came against him. However, to the east, the division of Brigadier General Benjamin Prentiss was not so fortunate. Prentiss and Sherman had about a quarter mile gap between their divisions, but it was the gap on Prentiss's left that would give him the most trouble. His entire division hadn't even gathered completely. Some of his troops had arrived the night before and some that morning. The units that opened the battle from that division had harassed the Confederate juggernaut approaching their position. Wood's brigade drove directly east through the south end of Ray Field as the rest of the corps swung north, and this caused the thinly defended Union line to buckle against the weight and they took up a position closer to their encampment. But the terrain did not offer an advantage like that of Sherman's division. The Union troops could see for a greater distance in this sector, but that was the extent of their superiority. Prentiss scrambled to send more troops to strengthen his lines. Confederate bullets tore into his ranks and he urgently sent messages to other division commanders to send what they could to his aid. A little after 8.30 a.m., confusion struck the Confederate ranks. According to Shaver, a unit in Wood's brigade panicked, causing the regiments from both brigades to fall back. But Wood insisted in his report that Shaver's men had been the first to break. Either way, the greenness of the Confederate army, many of whom had never seen battle, contributed to this kind of event happening all over the battlefield. The Confederates regrouped and pressed on against the Union line. Gladden's men ran into difficult terrain, and the 26th Alabama was forced to move to the right of the line to avoid the entanglement of the undergrowth. They would have to attack Miller's brigade and two batteries of artillery, the 5th Ohio Battery and the 1st Minnesota Battery, sitting astride the road. Because the field division was small for the batteries, one artilleryman stated they had to fight them within pistol range with only canister and quick-time shells. As the Confederates advanced, Prentiss rode over to Miller's brigade and told them to fire low, and when we shot, to be sure that we seen something to shoot at, for every C-Sesh that we killed, there would be one less to shoot at us. Gladden led his men into very close combat. Some soldiers stated, we ran up near enough to be certain that our balls would reach them. Getting that close to the enemy came with heavy casualties, including Gladden himself, when a shell fragment hit his shoulder and nearly took off his left arm. A doctor would amputate his arm, but after being transported to Corinth, Gladden would pass away. Bragg's battle line appeared on the field in that sector, with Gibson and Jackson's brigades supporting Wood, Shaver, and Gladden, while Chalmers' brigade extended Gladden's right. This reinforcement would help relieve the pressure from Gladden's beleaguered troops. Chalmers ordered a left wheel to find the Union's flank and hopefully turn it. Unbeknownst to the Confederate brigadier, the 15th Michigan guarding the flank was horribly under strength due to a number of soldiers being sent to guard the equipment, but it was without ammunition as well. When its commander brought that up to Prentiss, the division commander stated, our bayonets ought to be good for something. The Michiganders could only watch as the Mississippians and Tennesseans unleashed a hail of lead into their ranks with no way to respond. It didn't take long for them to break. Chalmers' men continued on down the Union line, next coming in contact with the 18th Wisconsin. Chalmers ordered a charge, but only the 10th Mississippi heard the order and dashed against the 18th Wisconsin. Seeing their comrades on the move, the 9th and 7th Mississippi regiments followed, but the 5th Mississippi and 52nd Tennessee never heard an order, but would follow later. Now the Badgers were retreating. One Wisconsin soldier wrote in his diary, We passed our encampment. I saw some breakfast cooked ready for eating. Of course, I did not sit down but ran up and took a pancake or biscuit. It served me for the day. Gladden and Shaver's brigades pressed Miller's regiments to its limits, until it broke under the pressure sending the blue-clad troops north towards Pittsburgh Landing. As the Confederates advanced over the blood-soaked battlefield, a Tennessean commented over the casualties. Some of them with their brains shot out, and two or three in a pile, some had their limbs broken and begging to have their wounds dressed, others cursing the man that wounded him, and some few was making peace with heaven. One Confederate, Sergeant George Dixon, was hit in the leg and was saved only by a gold piece he carried in his pocket. His sweetheart had given him the piece, and because it saved his life, he later had the bent coin inscribed. Shiloh, April 6, 1862, my life preserver. 
and his initials GED. The coin was found nearly a century and a half later on Dixon's body inside the recovered submarine, the CSS Hunley. Peabody's men were still holding, but not for long. When Wood and Shaver advanced in a renewed attack, they too got scattered. Peabody tried desperately to reform his men. He had been hit four times in the hand, thigh, neck, and torso, but was still barking orders until a bullet slammed into his face, just above his lips, killing him instantly. Some of Prentice's men went at a dead run back to the landing, and some even attempted to cross the Tennessee River. One staff officer asked one of them why he was running. The soldier replied, because I can't fly. Many of the Union surgeons stayed with their patients in the newly abandoned camps. Confederate Brigadier General Thomas Heinemann ordered those doctors to not be disturbed by the advancing rebels, and two rebel surgeons began dressing the wounds of both sides in the encampment. Confederates began to sit down and eat the prepared breakfast left by the Yankees. They read the personal letters from their sweethearts and in general, plundered. Some reports had Confederates bayoneting the wounded or the sick in the hospital. Johnston himself approached the encampment and quickly got the army back in order. From the abandoned Union camps, Johnston formulated the plan that would have huge repercussions for the Confederates in this battle. He thought he had turned the Union's left flank. What he did not know was that there was more divisions to the east and northeast. Therefore, he ordered the men who had just broke Prentice's line to advance the northwest, hoping to sweep up the rest of the Union Army. As his men began their swing, this put pressure on Sherman's brigades and scattered them. Then, Johnston realized his mistake. He quickly ordered the two brigades closest to him, Chalmers and Jackson's brigades, to follow General Jones Withers to the rear and then march back up the Bark Road. This created a huge gap in the Confederate line. He now had to order in the Reserve Corps under Breckinridge to fill that gap. Johnson's army was now awkwardly positioned with multiple weak points along the line. These weak points would play a significant role in the next sequence of events. The morning was passing away quickly, but there was much fighting left to do. Sherman and Prentiss had delayed long enough for the divisions under Hurlbut and W.H.L. Wallace to form a defensive line against the oncoming Confederates. Johnston was all over the field, directly controlling brigades and regiments as he saw fit. He personally deployed Breckinridge's command into the Confederate center and even made his way over to Jackson and Chalmers' brigades on the Confederate far right. What he saw boosted his confidence in a victory. In that sector, Jackson and Chalmers would face the lone brigade of Colonel David Stewart, made up of three regiments. Stewart was an inexperienced commander and his troops were inexperienced, but he knew the importance of his flank to the Union Army and ordered his regiments to cover a wide front. Jackson's brigade reached Stewart first and easily overwhelmed the Ohioans. Chalmers entered the fray, but the 54th Ohio delivered such a destructive fire against the 52nd Tennessee that all but two companies from the regiment broke and ran. Chalmers commented that he repeatedly attempted to rally the Tennesseans, but to no avail. The two companies that withstood the hail of lead fought the rest of the battle with the 5th Mississippi. Though the 54th Ohio was protected behind a fence and underbrush, the Confederate brigade forced them back. Next, the 55th Illinois stood in Chalmers' way, but the rebels overwhelmed the single regiment. Stuart organized a disjointed defensive line that held out for a little while, but would be forced back as well. Ulysses S. Grant had been working feverishly all that morning. He attempted to eat an early breakfast and meet with General Don Carlos Buell that morning, but the battle altered those plans. Grant, halfway through breakfast, got word of heavy artillery fire coming from one of the landings. He immediately sent word to Buell's divisions to hurry forward, in particular William Bull Nelson's division, which had already made it to Savannah. He sent Nelson to Pittsburgh Landing, and then stepped aboard the steamboat Tigress and met with Lew Wallace. Grant told him to watch his western front and await further orders. Next, Grant steamed toward Pittsburgh Landing. He arrived at around 8.30 a.m. to a fairly calm scene, but after conferring with W.H.L. Wallace, he understood the situation developing in his front. He had been surprised before, especially at Fort Donelson, but like his actions in that battle, he remained calm, cool, and collected. His first steps was to organize the forces around the landing and send them to aid the front line. Grant then sent word to Lew Wallace to move towards Pittsburgh Landing. The commanding general rode to the front and declared that the key to survival was nightfall. 
If he could delay the Confederates until darkness covered the battlefield, his reinforcements would be enough to launch a counterattack. He said as much to his aide, We've got to fight against time now. Wallace must be here very soon. The small Union force had defended itself against twice its number for six hours. Johnston had sent in almost his whole army to move two Union divisions out of the way. For the Confederate Corps commanders, their brigades were mixed up and fighting as individual components. Those commanders devised a plan to bring some order to the brigades, but ultimately confused the matter even worse. Hardy would command the far left. To his right, Polk, next Bragg, and then finally Breckenridge would control the far right brigades. Once the plan was hammered out, then each corps commander had to inform the brigades in their individual sector of the change, which only brought more confusion as to who individual brigades would answer to. To add to the chaos, now division commanders who normally control brigades would be in a limbo state with the respective brigades displaced all over the battlefield and answering to different corps commanders. The stiff resistance put up by Sherman and to a lesser extent Prentiss afforded the Union divisions under Hurlbut and McClernand enough time to put forward their brigades as a defensive line and a safe haven for the brigades of Prentiss and Sherman to reform behind. Much of the next phase of fighting would occur around a crossroads of the Corinth Road and the Hamburg Purdy Road. The Union brigades had filed in and around the two roads, hoping to delay the Confederates further. The fighting force that Johnston brought to the battlefield just hours earlier was not the army now attacking for a second time. Brigades were shot to pieces. Claiborne's men basically wouldn't move from their position around the Shiloh Church, and a host of other regiments who had been bloodied in multiple assaults against Sherman's line failed to move out when ordered. When the Confederate brigades did move out in a confusing mass against the Union line, multiple instances of friendly fire erupted. Specifically, the brigades of Russell and Stewart exchanged volleys with one another, not realizing they were firing on their own men. On the Union right, Colonel John McDowell's brigade was the flank and would be stunned when he saw the amount of Confederates poured into the field to their left and subsequently into the gap between his own brigade and Buckland's. To avoid being completely cut off from the rest of the army, McDowell pulled back, but this would compromise the integrity of the Union flank, since Pond and Anderson could now fire into Buckland's exposed flank. Buckland's Federal Brigade would be hit in both flanks when elements of Johnson's brigade pressed his left, Anderson pressed his front, and Pond's men approached his right flank. This forced Buckland back to find safety, just like McDowell had done. Further to the east, the Union brigades of Wraith, Marsh, and Hare with an exposed right flank would be hit by the elements of six brigades, but to their credit, they held their ground long enough to further bloody the already depleted Confederate ranks. Both sides took heavy casualties to regimental officers. For example, the 20th, 11th, and 48th Illinois all lost their regimental commanders. The 27th Tennessee lost their colonel, lieutenant colonel, and major in the fighting. Their brigade commander, General Wood, became thrown from his horse and drugged through one of the federal camps that the rebels had just captured. It would take him hours before he recovered. Wood's large brigade with few officers and a confused leadership became disjointed and many of his regiment would fight independent from their brigade for the rest of the battle. Brigadier General Alexander Stewart rode up to the commander of the 4th Tennessee, Otho Straw, and asked if he could take the 1st Illinois Artillery Battery D under Captain Edward McAllister. Straw responded by saying, Show us where it is, we will try. The 4th advanced within 30 paces against the battery. After taking a few artillery rounds to its ranks, they fired one volley and then charged. McAllister was wounded four times by the Tennesseans, but was able to escape with a few of his guns. The stress placed on the makeshift Union line prompted those blue troops to pull back. Thankfully for them, the Confederates were too disorganized and shot up to launch an immediate pursuit. Johnston's left wing had pushed back Sherman and McClernand's divisions, but the two Union generals were able to reform their men, and just like a door, the blue line had not shattered, but simply swung back with its hinge on Colonel Sweeney's brigade. Sherman and McClernand were now faced with a decision. The Confederates were not pursuing at the moment. Should they withdraw back to the landing, stand and wait for another Confederate attack, or launch a counter-strike? There was only one real answer. They must attack and delay the Confederates as much as possible. It was between 11.30 and noon when the Blue Line stepped off in their counter-attack. 
This caught the rebels off guard completely with Sherman and McClernand nearly taking up their former position near the crossroads. One of the very last reserve brigades under Colonel Robert Tribute, the brigade that would become the famous Orphan Brigade, was ordered to the front. It took up a position between Anderson and Russell's brigades and offered a stiff resistance against the oncoming Federals. A destructive firefight ensued with Tribute's men causing the Union line to buckle. The fight lasted nearly two hours, and at that point Sherman and McClernand decided to pull their brigades back to protect the rest of the army. Johnson's left wing pursued slowly and cautiously, but did little to hinder the withdrawn Federals. Many of the Confederate regiments were running low on ammunition or completely out, and soldiers had to pack boxes of cartridges on their backs over the dense and boggy terrain to their respective units. Further to the east, Hurlbut's men were in a defensive position in a peach orchard, where the Confederate right wing would soon engage them. On the Union left, brigades of men were fighting alongside regiments of other divisions in a somewhat tangled mess. But to Hurlbut's credit, he had organized them well and was preparing to defend this front against any possible Confederate attack. On Hurlbut's left, Stuart had delayed and exhausted the rebels under Chalmers to the point where the Mississippians stopped to rest once Stuart's men had sufficiently fallen back. They would not re-engage the enemy for multiple hours. Chalmers rode to Jackson and informed him that he would now need to take the lead in the following advance. It was in the early afternoon when the brigades of Jackson, Bowen, Statham, Maney, and Gibson approached the Peach Orchard where the Federals were positioned. The Confederates began their advance. A Union soldier described it in great detail. A brigade leaped the fence, line after line, and formed on the opposite side of the field. It was a splendid sight, those men in the face of death closing and dressing their ranks, which rapidly closed, not a man faltering in his place. And now the field officers waved their hats. A shout arose, and that column, splendidly aligned, took the double quick and moved on magnificently. We could not repress exclamations of admiration. The advance met with a horrendous fire from the Federal ranks and sent the entire line back in a disjointed mass, with some putting up some moderate resistance and others retreating for their lives. Eventually, the rebels reformed, but it was not surprising that the assault failed. Prior to attacking, word got to Breckenridge that the 15th Mississippi was out of ammunition. They had been ordered to take an artillery battery. Breckenridge, upon hearing the news, said, the 15th Mississippi doesn't need any cartridges. Take it with your bayonets. They broke before ever reaching that battery. The battle raged in that sector for an hour and a half with Southerners falling back and reforming to launch another attack. It was a terrible slaughter on both sides. The Confederates attacked the position multiple times, on many occasions in a piecemeal fashion, getting pushed back each time. On the Union right, the woods there caught fire, burning the dead and dying. One Confederate described the dead caught in the horrific scene. The flesh had been burned from their set teeth, giving them a horrible grin. Behind the Union position was a small pond that became known as the Bloody Pond, where dying soldiers crawled to the water's edge to get a drink, but eventually the pond would be turned red from the blood seeping from the wounds of the dead and dying. At one point, a herd of goats wandered between the battle lines. It didn't take long for them to be wiped out because of accidental shootings and through deliberate aim at the animals. One rebel wondered why a soldier would shoot at a goat when so many of the enemy were present to shoot. For most of the hour and a half of fighting, southern brigades had attacked in a piecemeal fashion with little coordination. Johnston, deeply concerned about his stalled out attacks, had rode to that sector and after being subject to enemy fire for about an hour, concluded that they are offering stubborn resistance here. I shall have to put the bayonet to them. He ordered all the brigades to attack at once. Breckenridge exclaimed that his Tennesseans wouldn't charge. Johnson said, I will help you. We can get them to make the charge. Breckenridge had had trouble out of the 45th Tennessee, which had performed poorly, and even shot into the flank of the 20th Tennessee during the assaults. Johnston sent Tennessee Governor Isham Harris to personally lead that regiment. Riding along the line of soldiers, Johnston tapped their bayonets with the little tin cup that he had taken from the Wisconsin camp. These must do the work, he shouted. Men, they are stubborn. We must use the bayonet. With the line now thrilling and trembling with that tremendous and irresistible ardor, one eyewitness wrote, Johnson wheeled Fire Eater around and yelled, I will lead you. 
the excited Confederates of Bowen's brigade immediately behind him burst forward, as if drawn to him by some overmastering magnetic force. The rest of the brigades moved as well in a coordinated assault against the stubborn Federals. Johnston advanced close to the Union line, then let the wildly advancing troops pass with even Breckinridge and his staff advancing with the brigades. The first group to make headway in breaking the Union line was Jackson's men. They swung around to the flank, trapping the 9th Illinois in a ravine that the Illinoisans were using to load before emerging to fire. The volleys were so destructive that the 9th Illinois sustained the highest number of killed and wounded of any regiment at Shiloh. It broke and the missing regiment in the Union line created dire situations for the other units. The Federals were now being flanked and many officers attempted to extricate their men from the deadly hail of lead. Brigadier General MacArthur got wounded in the foot and as he was helping his men withdraw, he was also worrying about a prized horse he had allowed one of his staff officers to borrow. When he found out it had been killed, he yelled, tell him to save the saddle. Before his left completely withdrew, Hurlbut sent the 32nd Illinois to their aid, but the stream of withdrawn comrades from MacArthur's brigade broke up their battle line, and eventually the Illinoisans knew they couldn't hold off such a large attack and withdrew with the rest of them. On the Union right, fresh rebel regiments were advancing on Hurlbut. Colonel George Maney of the 1st Tennessee, who had been sent to guard Greer's Ford at Lick Creek, was satisfied that no Federal units were approaching that direction and decided to join the battle at the Peach Orchard. The 19th Tennessee, who was guarding the ford with the 1st, came along as well. Together with the 9th Tennessee, Maney led them to the Federal lines. The Tennessean ordered his men to lie down, and after Union troops let loose their volley, Maney ordered them up and to charge. The Federal line was crumbling, mostly due to Johnston's initiative and leadership. The General of the Army, after leading his troops to the Blue Lines, returned to a knoll in the rear, thrilled. Isham Harris described his mood. I had never in my life seen him looking more bright, joyous, and happy than he looked at that moment that I approached him. The charge he had led was heroic. It had been successful, and his face expressed a soldier's joy and a patriot's hope. He had come fairly near death in the Confederate advance. He laughed at the fact that a spent bullet had stung him. His boot had even been hit, leaving the sole flapping. He ordered Harris to tell Statham to wheel his brigade to the left to attack a battery that had opened up on the left flank. When Harris returned, he found Johnston slumped over in his saddle on the left side about to fall. He asked, General, are you wounded? Johnston replied, yes, and I fear seriously. Harris and a nearby staff officer got him off his horse and into a ravine behind the lines. Captain W.L. Wickham rode away to find a surgeon. Johnston's personal surgeon had been ordered by Johnston himself to stay behind in the enemy's camp that had been captured and take care of the wounded, both Union and Confederate. Harris ripped open Johnston's jacket and shirt to find the wound and saw that he had been hit as many as four times by shrapnel and spent balls, but only one bullet had broke the skin and that was not in the least bit serious. A simple tourniquet could have possibly saved his life, what Harris didn't know was that a bullet had hit the back of Johnston's right knee and torn the popliteal artery. He was bleeding to death. But the hostile boot that he wore concealed the wound. In a few moments he ceased to breathe. He died calmly and, to all appearances, free from pain. Indeed, so calmly that the only evidence I had that he had passed from life was the fact that he ceased to breathe and the heart ceased to throb. It was 2.30 p.m., the staff had gathered around him and began to sob, even as the battle was still raging. The Federal line may have been broken, but Hurlbut was putting up stiff resistance on the withdrawal, and the Gray lines attempting to pursue were exhausted. Hurlbut set up a defensive line to stymie the Confederates. General Bragg, who was now in that sector, ordered for Chalmers' brigade to advance. They had been resting since pushing back Stewart's brigade. With the Mississippians attacking their flank, and more gray troops approaching their front, a bloody but quick engagement took place with one Indiana soldier describing it as the most hotly contested fight of the day. Hurlbut delayed the Confederates until about 4 p.m., a huge contribution to Grant's plan to make it to dark. The strong wings and weak center of the Confederate Army produced a bulge in their line, where a section of the Union battle line was putting up a fight against the less imposing rebel center. Both flanks were caving in around the group of blue troops with their front to Duncan Field. They never received the orders to withdraw and were staying put.
While the Confederate left wing pushed Sherman and McClernand towards Pittsburgh Landing, and while Johnston battled with Hurlbut at the Peach Orchard, the Confederate center encountered stiff resistance from some of W.H. Wallace's men. When Johnston launched his mass attack earlier in the day to push back Sherman and McClernand, Shaver's brigade had been surprised by fire coming from Sweeney's position, and they would fall back. While Bragg looked for another brigade to assault Sweeney and Tuttle, Beauregard had already sent Maney's brigade under Colonel William H. Stevens, who had recently rejoined his men from the sickbed and was still feeling ill, to that sector. Stevens faced the brigade made up of Iowans under Colonel James Tuttle and a conglomeration of regiments from various brigades to Tuttle's left. The Tennesseans marched into Duncan Field, receiving long-range musketry as they crossed. But when they reached the center of the field, a murderous fire came from the blue troops on both of their flanks. The rebels couldn't take the punishment and fell back to safety and moved further to the right to support Statham in his attacks on the Peach Orchard, where Maney would rejoin the brigade for the attack that sent the blue troops back. The ease with which Tuttle and Sweeney's men held their position gave them renewed confidence about their position. However, the sound of gunfire when Stevens' men were forced out of Duncan Field drew the attention of the Confederate brigades to the west. Sherman and McClernand's withdrawal produced a lull in the battle on the west side of the battlefield, while the troops in the Peach Orchard continued the bloody fight. General Heinemann rounded up Stewart's brigade to attack Tuttle's men, but an artillery shell hit his horse and exploded inside the animal, throwing Heinemann, disorienting him. Therefore, Stuart took command. He worked hard to assemble elements of four other brigades, including two regiments from Claiborne's beleaguered brigade, to assault the Union position. However, once assembled and marched into the field, Stuart reported his men had no ammunition, something that should have been checked before moving toward the enemy, which forced Stuart to seek protection in the forest from which they came. There, the mismatched brigade broke apart, with men leaving the ranks to refill their cartridge boxes and others attempting to find their proper brigades. Braxton Bragg, the commander of that sector, searched for a fresh brigade to throw against the Union line. He found Randall Gibson's brigade, being only slightly engaged up to that point. The Arkansas and Louisiana troops meandered through a dense undergrowth towards W.H. Wallace's men. Wallace, seeing a gap in the line between himself and the regiment's guard in the Peach Orchard, sent in the 8th Iowa to plug that hole in the line and they immediately became engaged with Gibson's men. The commander of the 14th Iowa reported that his regiment waited until the Confederates came within 30 paces and then sent a mass of lead into the enemy ranks, commenting that the enemy's first line was completely destroyed. The Louisianians reported a similar event, that a volley from the Union line blunted their attack for the moment and the Louisianian also declared that the bullets sounded like swarms of angry hornets, and the name, the Hornet's Nest, stuck. Gibson's brigade could hardly see the enemy, if at all, so he ordered his men to fix bayonets. They again moved towards the underbrush and received more volleys for their trouble that repulsed their attack. Gibson reformed his battle line, dressed his ranks, and moved forward again. Portions of the brigade would attack the Hornet's Nest as many as four times, and each time, they got repulsed. During one of the attacks, a cannonball took off half of a soldier's head. He threw up his hands and walked two or three steps in advance of the charging ranks and pitched stiffly forward on his face. Much of the man's blood and brains splattered the captain of the regiment in the face. He threw his coat sleeve across his face, wiping away the hideous defilement and coolly crying, it's all right boys, come on, as nothing had happened. Bragg rode close to the fighting and personally sent in the 4th Louisiana under Colonel Henry W. Allen. A few moments later, Allen walked back into the field during the withdrawal with blood pouring from a wound in the cheek, and he barked the order, Here, boys, is as good a place as any on this battlefield to meet death. The brigade withdrew to safety after the last repulse, and the men sat down to rest their weary bodies, and a few of the men began playing a game of poker. Gibson's brigade would help push back the Union line at the Peach Orchard a little further south. Bragg searched for another brigade to throw against the Union line. He found Shaver's brigade, beat up with only a few regiments present for duty. At 2.30 p.m., they attacked the Hornet's Nest, but the Union line held firm and repulsed the rebels. More officers began to take notice of the stubborn Federals near the Hornet's Nest, and they, like the other commanders, grabbed the nearest units to launch another assault. This time, Anderson's brigade would attack in conjunction with two regiments, the 38th Tennessee and the Crescent Regiment, on the Union right. 
At 3.30 p.m., those regiments stepped off to launch their own attack. Anderson's men got slowed down in the dense undergrowth just like Gibson's men, and the two rebel regiments to the west got flanked by the Illinoisans and Iowans. That attack failed just like the others. The Confederate high command in the center was understanding now that the position could not be carried by frontal assaults and began assembling a massive amount of artillery, between 50 and 60 field guns, to dislodge the Yankees from their seemingly impregnable position. The blast from the cannons roared over the landscape, sending projectiles into the awaiting Federals. It did not drive off the infantry, but multiple batteries withdrew under the heated barrage, but the blue infantry were staying put. One infantryman commented that the road on which they were aligned looked like a carpet of paper from the cartridges we had bitten off. The time was 4.30 p.m., and the stubborn Federals were now in trouble. The Confederates, personally led by Johnson on their left in the Peach Orchard, broke through the Union line. Those regiments, who didn't retreat northward, pulled back, creating a right angle to Tuttle's line. Bragg, realizing what happened, quickly sent word to all brigade commanders to converge on the hornet's nest. McClernand and Sherman had pulled back on Wallace's right, and Prentice's line on the left disintegrated, leaving Wallace's line in the hornet's nest all alone. Making the situation worse, the 7th Illinois, on the right, moved back as the Confederates capitalized on the disappearance of McClernand to Sweeney's right. The 58th Illinois was now vulnerable to more attacks in their flank, and the rebels were beginning to surround the command. A soldier brought out a white flag. The colonel of the 58th, William Lynch, rode up to the gentleman and cut the staff in two with his sword, determined to make a stand. The Union line began to waver as some units tried to fight their way out of the situation. Wallace personally directed regiments toward gaps in the Confederate lines, but the enemy skirmishers were closing in. Wallace stood up in the stirrups to get a better view and was struck in the head. His wife had arrived that morning to visit her husband. He didn't know she was there, but a staff officer told her of his death. The Confederate trap completely clamped shut at around 5.45 p.m. 2,200 Federals eventually surrendered. Confederate cavalry chased down many of the blue troops who escaped the encirclement. To the north, Sherman and McClernand and Hurlbut formed a new defensive line and awaited the rebels, hoping dark would come soon. It had been a long and bloody day for Albert Sidney Johnson's army, now under PGT Beauregard. They had pushed the Union Army back towards Pittsburgh Landing and captured thousands of enemy troops, but it had come at a terrible cost. They lost their army commander and numerous division and brigade commanders. It was a confusing time for the Confederate High Command, but to fully secure the victory, they needed to follow up on their success. At Pittsburgh Landing, Grant was taking the battered divisions of Sherman, McClernand, W.H.L. Wallace, and Hurlbut and formed them into another defensive line to defend the landing. He had been building this third line since about 2.30 p.m., and by 5 p.m., it was prepared to hold the landing at all costs. One of the most influential men coordinating the placement of troops was Grant's chief of staff, Colonel Joseph D. Webster, who was an experienced artilleryman. As expected from a cannoneer, this third line would depend heavily on cannons to overwhelm attacking Confederates. So influential was Webster that when he was looking for artillery to man the line, he found the 1st Illinois Light Artillery Battery H, who didn't have horses to pull the pieces and the men had never fired their guns. Webster, in the middle of the battle, drilled the battery of men and placed sacks of corn around them to create a small earthwork to calm the nerves about the approaching enemy. Once the infantry and artillery was in place, men remembered seeing Webster mounted on his horse, riding up and down the line, shouting encouragement, saying, Stand firm, boys. They can never carry this line in the world. Along with the infantry and artillery, two major gunboats, the Lexington and the Tyler, sat in the Tennessee River, prepared to deliver devastating volleys in order to defend the landing. The first to probe the new position was Wharton and Brewer's bands of cavalry but they were no match for the Blue Infantry, no matter how bloody the Union troops were. The brigades of Pond and Claiborne, instead of heading towards the Hornet's Nest, were distracted by Yankee movements to the Northeast. They would be the next Confederates to probe Grant's impressive third defensive line. Pond's men took the brunt of the attack, engaging with the group of Blue troops under the command of Colonel Wraith. Pond's regiments attacked an echelon, with the 18th Louisiana attacking first, being pushed back, 
and then the Orleans guards made their attempt, but they could not withstand the hail of lead thrown at them. Finally, the 16th Louisiana made a half-hearted attack against Wraith, but after witnessing what happened to their advancing comrades, their commander broke off the attack early. The Union line resembled a T at that point, but after the Louisianians were driven off, Grant's army pulled back into an L shape. To the east, Braxton Bragg worked feverishly to assemble what brigades he could to follow up on the advance. He assembled elements of four brigades, Chalmers, Jackson, Anderson, and two regiments from Gladden's brigade now under Zachariah Dees. When the order came to advance, many of the men refused to move against so impressive of a defensive line, peppered with artillery. Some had marched over six miles that day and fought for 13 hours. They would find refuge in a ravine from the artillery blasts and small arms fire. Chalmers' men, and to a lesser extent Jackson's troops, were the only ones to engage with the blue troops, but it's debated how much fighting actually took place. Chalmers reported making multiple charges, but this seems like an exaggeration as others, both Union and Confederate, reported mostly just skirmishing. The Union artillery did their job intimidating the rebels and driving off the battery attached to Chalmers' brigade, which had weathered the battle with the Mississippians since the first attacks. As both sides hunkered down for the night, exhausted over what had transpired that day, Grant began receiving reinforcements by the thousands, from Don Carlos Buell across the river and Lew Wallace making his way south. Numerous tales have swirled around the historical record attempting to explain why Wallace was late and didn't make it to the battle on the first day. He did not receive the orders to move until 11.30 a.m. when the quartermaster of the army, Captain A.S. Baxter, relayed that information to him. Now there is dispute as to in what fashion was Wallace supposed to travel. Wallace believed he was to move to the right of the army, which meant near Sherman's position. But Grant argued that he ordered Wallace to come directly to the landing. However, the commander of the army admitted that he did not know what the order actually said once it got to Wallace. The order went from Grant to Captain John A. Rollins to Captain Baxter to Wallace. Nevertheless, Wallace had his men prepare lunch and was on what he thought to be the quickest route to the scene of the fighting by noon. Grant sent numerous couriers to hurry Wallace along, and when he was about to cross Clear Creek, Grant's aide, Captain W. R. Raleigh, arrived and asked where he was going. Wallace replied that he was heading to the right of the army. The messenger turned pale and said, Don't you know Sherman has been driven back? Why, the whole army is within half a mile of the river, and it's a question if we are not all going to be driven into it. Once Wallace recovered from the news, he countermarched his division and headed down the river road, guided by local civilians. Wallace would arrive on the field late, but only through miscommunication and not enough information to make the correct decisions. During the night of April 6th, Grant placed his reinforcements in the line, despite a harsh rainstorm consuming the battlefield. One soldier remembered, it was dark and it rained and the only relief we had was to pull off our knapsacks and sit on them for a change. I remember that the rain ran down the back of my neck into my shoes. The Army of the Tennessee's camp equipment had been captured by Confederates and the reinforcements had left most of their equipment behind to make better time. One captain informed his colonel that the regiment had no food. He was told to tell his men to sit down and suck their thumbs. A lucky soldier who got food stated we were furnished with some crackers and raw meat which was eaten without cooking, as we dare not make a fire. Grant was also recovering from the scenes he had witnessed that day. One member of his staff got decapitated by a cannonball right next to him covering the army commander with blood and brain matter. Grant rode all over the battlefield examining the fighting personally and had some close calls. A canister shot hit his sword scabbard and bent it. He set up headquarters under a big oak tree after being sickened by the screams and anguished cries of the wounded in the makeshift hospital that had been his headquarters. Sherman came to Grant under his tree in the rain with the idea of broaching the subject of retreat thinking the only thing just then possible, as it seemed to me, was to put the river between us and the enemy and recuperate. At the last minute, he became embarrassed and blurted out, Well, Grant, we've had the devil's own day, haven't we? A determined Grant, his mind already made up, responded, Yes, lick him tomorrow, though. 
He then ordered me to get all things ready at daylight the next day to assume the offensive. Grant was determined to use his numbers and the Confederates' own exhaustion against them the next day to win a major victory. Wagons full of ammunition traversed the defensive lines distributing ammunition for the next day's attack. One soldier wrote, No one talked of tomorrow. We knew we had to fight a victorious enemy who was expecting an easy end into the battle, nothing less than unconditional surrender. But we knew in our hearts that we were going to lick them. Historian, historian, where do you roam? Historian, historian, far, far from home. Have history will travel, he's the card of a man. A professor with knowledge in the hard land. To educate the world. A professor of fortune is a man called Historian Historian